Hello, my name is Eric Seaton, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. All right, so we're in this grief and gratitude series, and a couple things. One, this morning, Corey and Colleen spoke about grief and gratitude, and it was a super powerful sermon, and I would suggest that you go watch the video or you listen to the podcast in conjunction to what you're hearing tonight. Um, I'm anticipating Mark, if this morning was any kind of indication of what the Spirit is doing, tonight will be also a very powerful moment for all of you. So, with great anticipation, Mark is going to tell us how to hold grief and gratitude in tension. So if you go to YouTube and just pull up Corey and Colleen's sermon, I'm just going to go sit down. <laughs> we can all watch that again. <laughs> all right. Um, I do have slides. So, oh, great. Cool. Yeah, I'll take that. Sweet. All right. It does not have a wire. That's true. We'll see if it works anyway. (laughs) Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for um, this community, for time to come together, uh, to consider your word, to listen to each other's stories, um, to walk into grief and gratitude, and um, to praise you. Bless his time, give us hearts to hear your word, to hear you speaking. Um, in your name I pray, amen. All right, so we are in a series on grief and gratitude, and today we're going to be talking about holding the tension between the two. Um, and so a really good picture of that is last week Eric talked about Um, what it looks like to practice the discipline of gratitude and what it looks like to practice the discipline of grief and how those um, two things happen. Um, And so what we're really going to do kind of is is talk about how, what it looks like when we do that. Um, when, When we are able to hold the tension of practicing the discipline of gratitude and the discipline of grief, what does that look like? And as part of that, so for the first section of my sermon, we're going to talk through a few of my stories. Um, and we're going to look at those and consider um, the stories, some, a couple stories of grief in my life and kind of expand a little bit on how we understand grief. Um, and then we're going to read Psalm 77 together, and I'm going to talk to you about why it's my favorite psalm. So that's what we're going to do tonight, all right? Okay. Here we go. So, grief and gratitude. Let's see if this works. There we go. All right. It's a cute picture, huh? All right. So, on the left picture, the kid on the far left, that's me. Um, And then the kid on the far right, that's me. And the two kids in the middle are my friend Bobby. Um, So, the first picture is when we're probably little under two years old, Um, so it's more or less 1989-ish, late 89, early 90. Um, And then the second picture is from 1995 when I'm I'm seven years old, and I know that because it has a little 95 on it. So this is my friend Bobby. Bobby was my best friend. Bobby's parents went to church with my parents, And they lived down the street from us. So I remember going to Bobby's house. And I remember Bobby's mom telling him, you have to take Marky bites. Because Bobby took really small bites and Marky took really big bites. So you have to take Marky bites. And by the way, Bobby's mom is the only person in the world who still calls me Marky. In fact, I saw her a couple years ago. And she said, Marky! It was very sweet. Lee Ganson. 
So Bobby was my best friend, and we went to church together, we went to play group, um, we went to kindergarten together, we were in the same kindergarten class. And then about halfway through kindergarten, exactly halfway through kindergarten, um, my parents had been thinking about being missionaries in Mexico and received a call to go be missionaries in Mexico. And so halfway through kindergarten, we moved from Michigan away from Bobby um, to Nogales. And my dad is a doctor in the United States. He's right over there. Um, my brother, David, he's right there. He was in seventh grade. And we moved to the border. And um, so I went to school in the United States. And first day of first grade, no one in my class, or not no one, but the kids who sat across from me first day of first grade did not speak any English. And my Spanish was still very poor. <laughs> Maybe not. It was, it, was get, it was coming along. And we went to church in Mexico, and I had a friend in Mexico, but I had, I had a hard time making friends at school. And I didn't have any friends for the first two years of school. The, second, the picture on the right is actually us going back to Michigan after we had already gone. Uh, to Nogales, and we would do that every summer or so, and I would get to spend a couple days with Bobby. Um, but I really just did not, it wasn't the same. I didn't have, I wasn't best friends with Bobby anymore. Um, and that really began a pattern in my life. So as a third culture kid, someone who grows up outside of their culture um, in the context of another, in another culture, um, I have a hard time feeling like I belong anywhere. I have a hard time feeling rooted anywhere. Um, and when I went off to college, I actually got to reunite with Bobby, and I spent the year, my first year of college, in a small group with him. But we didn't spend any time together outside of that small group. Um, and I, I haven't seen Bobby in 15 years. And along the way through high school and over the last 15 years or so, I've had a lot of friends come into my life, been really closely connected with them, and then had them walk away. Or I had to move again to another place, and I lost contact, lost friendships. And I have had to learn how to grieve over those lost friendships. Because over the last two years, what I've realized, or the last year and a half, what I've realized alongside Eric and Rod um, and with my wife and in Pilgrim Group um, is that I have had a hard time creating new friendships. Now, I have the village, and I have lots of close relationships here. Um, but in many ways, I still hold on to when, a, when is this relationship, when is this person going to walk out of my life? When is this person going to leave? Is it okay for me to be in an intimate friendship um, and be vulnerable in relationship? Um, because I am afraid that if I walk into that, that then that person's going to walk out. Grief is not, it's not always about death. It's not always about sickness. Grief is a good response in relationship with God to the brokenness in this world, to the sin in this world. And loss is, is not always about death. Sometimes loss is just about loss of relationship. It's about loss of place. It's about, I can't, I can't go back to my parents' house in Nogales because they don't live there anymore. <laughs> There's a loss of the house that I grew up in. Um, we all experience these losses. We all experience the brokenness in this world.
So grief and lost friendships. The second story that I want to tell is about grief and community. So grief happens in community. In fact, it happens in community at a very, very large scale. So over the last two years, we have all been experiencing a worldwide grief, a worldwide experience of loss and the brokenness of this world in COVID. We've all been walking through that. We've also, in recently, we've experienced sort of a worldwide trauma of war happening in Ukraine and over the last many, many years in Afghanistan and Syria and around the world. So we all experience that and have to learn to grieve it. We also, in this community, on a smaller level, we experience grief. Um, we just experienced a piece of that when we said, we're going to have one service on Sunday. Right? Yes, we're going to have one service on Easter Sunday. We're going to have one service on Easter Sunday. But the reality is, is that we all used to be in one service in the evening. And when we went to two services, we experienced a loss of relationship in that. So we go to, I, I go to Soup Supper and I see everybody every week. I go to Soup Supper and I see people walk up to each other and go, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in years. This is amazing. And I go, I saw both of you last week. <laughs> What's happening here? But it's because one person goes in the morning, one person goes in the evening. There's, there's a, a loss. We also experience loss on, in community and on smaller levels. And this picture is my art project from the Belonging Service in 2016. Um, so it's the puzzle pieces that are out in uh, the dining room. Okay. Who, who can tell what this is? <laughs> it is a puzzle piece. Okay. My wife says not to not to ask that question. I just I'll just tell you what it is. I I am not a great drawer, artist, visual artist. Um, this is a poppy seed, and those are poppy flowers that my wife drew around the poppy seed. So in in 2016, my wife was pregnant for the first time, and she had an app, and the app gave you the size relative to like fruit or whatever of your baby. And so the one of the first ones, one of the early ones is your baby is the same size as a poppy seed, which is super tiny. And we just thought that was adorable. And so we started calling the baby the poppy seed. And really early on we had some issues and um, thought they weren't anything, and then went in for our first appointment um, and found out that Lane was having a miscarriage, and so we lost the poppy seed. And so when we made our belonging projects, I, I drew a poppy seed. So we lost the poppy seed, and that was a really sharp pain for Lane and I. And then... We only got pregnant again, and we got Sirsha. And Sirsha is just a delight and a joy in our life. She is dancing over here and running around, and she's excited about her new shoes. She's a delight. And then Lane got pregnant again and had another miscarriage, and then she had another miscarriage, and then she had another miscarriage. And then we had Thomas. And Thomas is beautiful, and strong, and laughs, but you have to really work at getting him to laugh. 
And he is 11 months old today, which is fun. We love Thomas. But Lane has been pregnant six times. And we have two children. We've lost four. And we have to walk together in that. We have to walk together in that grief. We have to recognize and and be grateful for relationship with one another. We have to be grateful for relationship with the children that we have. And we have to grieve over the loss of those four children. And holding those two things together is, is, is hard and painful. It's not always present. It's not always there. I don't always remember the poppy seed. And I had to think through, okay, when was this? Which belonging project was this? I had to Because it wasn't immediately present in my mind exactly when it was. But Every time it does, I have to hold those two things together, and I have to walk into it with my wife. To be able to walk together in it, we have to be thankful and grateful for one another, for the ways that God has entered into our lives. We have to be grateful for Thomas and Sirsha, and we have to be willing to be soft to the sadness and the grief of losing the other four. In both of these, there's an element of of loss and grief. In my friendships, I have grown hard in ways. I've grown hard in relationship because the stories that I've told are about how my friends have abandoned me. That they went off and did things that they shouldn't have done or they never called me or you know, they chose to walk away from me. That's, that's the story I tell story I tell. But what I'm invited into in grief is to tell the stories that I'm thankful for. To be thankful for the relationships that God has walked me through. Because if I'm able to tell those stories and be grateful, then I am able to be sad at the loss of those relationships. If the only story that I'm telling is of someone walking away from me, then I will be hard to new friendships. I will be hard to new relationships. I have to be able to be thankful and to grieve to walk into new relationships. I have to hold those two things in tension. In relationship with my wife, I have to be thankful for my children, and I have to grieve the four that we don't have. To enter into relationship with my wife, to care for her, and to help her be sad, I have to be sad. I have to grieve. Which brings us to my own sin. Because the brokenness in this world that we grieve is not just in the war in Ukraine. It's not just in loss of friendships, loss of um, the, the death of close people to us. It's not just in that, but it's, it's grief over our own brokenness, our own sin, the ways that we hurt the people around us. Psalm 51 is a psalm of grief. The heading on Psalm 51, which 
many of you may know, says, For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. That's the heading for Psalm 51. So David, in being confronted with his sin, in being confronted with the ways that he sinned against his God, against Bathsheba, in killing her husband, in committing adultery, he writes this psalm. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And later on, he says, The sacrifices of God are a broken and a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, you, God, you will not despise. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. David cries out and appeals to the character of God. He says, you have unfailing love. You have great compassion. I have sinned. I am broken. I will walk into relationship with you because I know that you love. I know that you have compassion. My sin is always before me. My sin is always before me. Cleanse me with hyssop. Create in me a pure heart, O God. The invitation from David is not to push away our sin and our brokenness, but to hold it out to God. To hold it out to Him because He is unfailing in his love. He has great compassion. The reality is, is the last sermon of the Encounters with Jesus series, we talked about the cross. We talked about all the different people who are around the cross. And if I am unwilling to acknowledge the brokenness within me, then I will stand before the cross and I will mock Jesus and I will say, get down. Just get down. You're okay. You saved people. Save yourself. If I'm unwilling to walk into my brokenness and hold it before God, but David recognizes God's love. We can walk before Jesus see him on the cross, and see the love that he has for us, the compassion that he has for us, and hold out our sin and offer it to him and be grateful and thankful in relationship with him that he has love for us and that he has compassion on us and also grieve our own brokenness that makes his sacrifice necessary. So we hold all these things. Lost friendships. Lost children. The sin that is within me. And I hold all these things. Um, and I wonder, 
what it looks like to hold these in tension, to hold gratitude and grief together and to walk into relationship with God. And in many ways, it looks a lot like what Eric talked about last week, which is to practice the discipline of gratitude, to practice the discipline of grief. So I stole Eric's slide here (laughs) from last week. Um, So practices for for gratitude. I didn't pull up, I didn't hold, post the grief one because I want to talk specifically about this. To have awareness of what's around you, to pay attention, to remember, to practice your memory, to tell stories of what God has done, to be thankful for what God has done, and then to say the words, to say thank you in relationship here with God, to say thank you. If you listen to the sermon this morning, Colleen gives a a beautiful picture of what this looks like in her life. So this is the discipline of gratitude. And in Psalm 77, which is my favorite psalm, we see a picture of what it looks like to walk into grief when you have practiced the discipline of gratitude. To be in grief, to be in the midst of pain and struggle and loss, as someone who has practiced the discipline of gratitude. So Psalm 77. Psalm 77 breaks down into four sections, and each section is broken up by the word selah, which means stop, pause, and think on this. So the first section is verses 1 through 3, and the psalmist is crying out for help. He cries out for help, saying, I am... We're going to read it in a minute. This is the the piece of loss, the piece of brokenness, the piece of sin. I'm crying out for help. And then it says, Selah, stop and think about this. And then the second section, verses 4 through 9, is where is God in my loss? Where is God in my grief? Where is God in, in this brokenness? And he asks six very poignant questions about God, about about God. And then the third section, verses 10 through 15, the psalmist appeals to the character of God. We talked last week about the the, the difference between um, complaint and lament, where complaint, you attack the character of the person, but crying out to God is appealing to his character, to what is true. So that's the third section, appealing to the character of God. And then the fourth section, verses 16 through 20, is a retelling of a well-practiced story. Retelling a well-practiced story. So what we're going to do is we're going to read it. I'm going to read Psalm 77. I'm going to read it slowly. And I'm going to leave space where it says Selah. I'm just going to say Selah, which means pause and think on this. And I invite you, I'm, we're going to move through the different sections. The writing's going to be a little bit small, but if you can't see it, you can hold a Bible or just listen to me read it out loud. But we're going to look at this. And I want you to consider the crying out for help. And where is God in my loss, in my grief? Where is God? Or And then appeal to the character of God and then retelling of a well-practiced story. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to leave space in between each section. And then I'm going to tell you why it's my favorite psalm. All right? Let's read. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands 
and my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered you, O God, and I groaned. I mused, and my spirit grew faint. Selah. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart mused and my spirit inquired, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Selah. Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years of the right hand of the Most High, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen, You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Amen. All right. Here's why I love this psalm. I love this psalm because at no point do the circumstances of the writer change. At no point do the circumstances of the writer change. It doesn't say, and then God saved me, and I remembered him. It doesn't say, I cry out to God for help, and now he saved me from this thing, and now I will remember what he did. There are other psalms that are much closer to that, but this psalm, doesn't say that. The circumstances of the psalmist do not change. He goes straight from, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Straight from that to then I thought, to this I will appeal the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. His circumstances are the same. 
He's still in the midst of his pain. He's still in the midst of his brokenness, still in the midst of, of grief. But he goes to appeal to the character of God. And he tells a well-practiced story. A story that he's told again and again. The writer of the Psalms, so the story that he tells is the story of the crossing of the Red Sea, right? which is in the book of Exodus. The writer of this Psalm was not there. <laughs> he wasn't there. He knows the story. He's been told the story. He knows what God did. In the midst of his grief, he remembers what God did. As we walk through pain and struggle, as we walk through the brokenness of this world, as we walk through lost friendships and lost children and war and lost parents, lost siblings, as we experience the pain of this world, we walk into grief by holding on to what God has done. We walk into that pain and walk into that grief by clinging to what is true about God. None of us here were there at the cross. But we've received a long, long history of the thankfulness and the gratitude of what Jesus did on the cross. Of the pain that he suffered to draw us into relationship with him. To draw us into relationship with the Father. We walk through grief, clinging to the truth of Jesus. And practicing the stories of thankfulness and gratitude. That's why Psalm 77 is my favorite psalm. I have some space to respond. And I have a mic. (laughs) Oh, and Eric does too. (laughs) Um, This is probably a a common theme, but uh, among all the sermons, but it really struck me this time that um, grief and gratitude both sort of start with acknowledging and being honest about reality and uh with with your story about your friend and um and that experience you have to be honest in order to grieve you have to acknowledge the goodness you have to acknowledge the pain the loss and um i think that's maybe a discipline all all its own is just being honest about reality both external and internal reality and it's not an easy thing maybe particularly in this day and age when there's so much to distract us or you know whatever so thanks matt I like that he, in this psalm, he doesn't say, now everything's okay because I remember this, but instead he's saying, this is what I'm, this is what I'm going to appeal to is, is this, it feels like you're this God that is not answering, is not merciful, but I'm going to appeal to the God of 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 my gratitude memory and and hope that you're going to you're going to be who you have been. Yeah. I think uh this week I was talking about the um 
Jesus calming the storm with someone. And they said, well, what should I have done? Just laid down and gone to sleep next to Jesus. And in the midst of the storm, the fact that Jesus is sleeping is just so crazy. And he has compassion on them in their fear, and he calms the storm. But, I mean, I, you, you do wonder what would it have looked like for them to see Jesus and to say, well, Jesus is asleep, so I'm just going to lay down next to him. <laughs> I was just thinking, and it kind of reminded me of what you said, Matt, just now, like, so to piggyback, how much, um, like, when you read Psalm 51, you know, it seems like we are, and we're so individualistic, like, privy to, like, it's in the first person, it's like, you know, reading a book of, like, David, David's regret, but, like, Nathan talked to him, everyone in the army knew what he had done, like, it's so public, like, the level of shame of what he's done, and so, like, his confession, therefore, is so public, and I think I'm just struck by, like, the temptation to handle our sin in private, not that grief, I don't know, it reminded me of Eric's sermon a couple weeks ago. Like, there is a level of, you know, like, I'm not going to talk about the miscarriages all the time with everybody. But, like, there is a level of, like, especially when it comes to our own sin, um, like, healing that cannot be accessed if we try to, like, handle it on our own. Or, like, I'm just going to tell God about this and no one else. Like, there is always going to be shame that the enemy will creep in if we don't like allow light to come in with community. And, and I was just struck reading that like for the choral director, like <laughs> Nathan said that, like they sing it, like that's horrifying. Like, and such a level of like depravity that of what he did and that we even know about it thousands of years later. Um, it's just really compelling to think like how do we deal with our own sin and our confessions i don't know yeah. Yeah. what i so yes i think when we We don't walk around all the time saying, here's my struggle. We don't walk around all the time saying, here's the thing that I am, that I, here's the terrible thing that I did, and I'm just going to tell you about it all the time. But holding those things with open hands and being willing to be changed and transformed. Like that's what's so good about Psalm 51 is there's a transformation in David's heart to go to Jesus, to go to God and acknowledge his unfailing love. Um, so yeah, we don't go around all the time, but we, we still have to be willing to, especially in community, to talk about our sin, to talk about our brokenness, because otherwise it, it becomes something that, that festers. So Vivi has it, and Eric has his hand up, and so does Daniel. <laughs> um, so this sermon was actually really hard. Sorry. I think it was something simple, like we went to the swamp meet last night, and my nephew was tired. So then Jesse was carrying him and he just fell asleep. And he looked so comfortable. And I was like, I asked Jesse, I said, are you, do you want me to carry him? He's like, no, I got it. And he walks away. And I think it was just so hard for me to see, like, how safe my nieces and nephews are around Jesse. And like, every time I walk through the door, 
they say, where's Uncle Jesse? And I'm like, hi to you too. Like, I am human too. <laughs> like, and uh, I think for me, it's like, for those of you who don't know my story, um, we aren't able to have kids naturally. Like, we have to go through IVF and stuff. And so, I think I, with what Lane was saying, like, not to hold on to that by yourself. Like, talk to people about it. And, uh, it's just hard. It's hard to see that people are having babies and, like, you want to be so happy for them. But yet, it's so hard because you're like, but I'm, I'm missing out on that. So I guess, like, I guess my question is, like, how do you... How do you find joy in something that is supposed to be exciting when you're grieving it? Um, and I know that it's something that I've been really working on with my pilgrim group and my husband, my husband's family. Um, but like, just, I don't know. I guess I just wonder, like, how do you find, when you're grieving, how do you find joy in things that are supposed to be exciting? when you're so sad yeah you know yeah so those lost children i don't think about them all the time the reality is that they're they're there in my story and I have to hold the grief of, of having lost them and I walk into that with my wife in particular because she holds the same grief and we have to walk into that together because for example if we want to have another child I am immediately thrust into that same fear again. Because that was the first time it felt like, ah, well, like I'm going to hold this. It's a sharp pain. And then we had Searsha and it was like, all right, we're going to move forward. And I'm going to hold the poppy seed and I'm going to hold Searsha and I'm going to receive those two things in relationship with God. And then we had the second, third, and fourth miscarriages to the point where it felt like, why are we doing this? Why? If it's just going to happen again. Which is where I am now if we have a third child is I'm holding that same fear, the same loss that I experienced those four times. And having Searsha and having Thomas, I'm, I am so thankful for them, but it doesn't change the fear that I experience as I walk into it again. And I have to acknowledge that and walk alongside my wife in it. Because it's there. And what I hold on to is that I, I'm loved. That despite, not despite, but even in the grief, even in the pain and the loss, I am loved. The, the circumstances of the psalmist don't change. But he still walks into those stories. He still tells the stories of what God has done. So the story I'm telling is not, well, I have Thomas. The story I'm telling is, God is good. 
and he has met me in my pain before, and he will meet me in my pain again. And I can walk alongside my wife in that same grief. That's, that's what I have. Dana. Hey, so um, I've been reading through First and Second Samuel, and I've always looked a lot up to David in that God says, or, well, in the Bible it says many times that he was a man after God's own heart. And uh, working through that with my pilgrim group, we, we stopped on that and thought more. I always thought of it as he was... he was built in the image of God as we all are. And I was like, oh, great. So it's just specifically shown through David. And we were talking about how he was after, he was chasing after God's own heart. And um, I think part of that is building the relationship through lamenting and going through the process of what this psalm offers, which is, explaining where you're at to God because he wants to hear it and he can hold that and he can be with you in that. And yep. it's hard to, I've been going through a lot of loss as many of you know, and it's hard to always sit in that and believe that God is sitting there with you, but um, it's there. And so anyway, I just admire David in that and I'm always moving towards that. Um, and so, yeah, one of the ways I just want to offer is, uh, I've been practicing the, uh, Trinitarian prayer that I hear in the Healing the City podcast, and that's been really helpful, and I think it's actually very similar to this process, which is, um, yeah, anyway, you should listen to the podcast if you want to learn more. It's great. So, yeah. A little plug. Yeah, he, I mean, he says in Psalm 51, that the, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That the heart of, of David is one that is, is broken in relationship with God. That there is sin, but then that sin is offered to God in, in brokenness and lament. And I think that's what's so huge about David. And in contrast to Saul who when Saul sinned and was confronted, he grew hard-hearted and pushed away, whereas David is confronted and enters in and walks into relationship. Yeah. Yeah, and then we, yeah. Uh, I just wanted also to respond to Vivi's question. I think that was a good response to Vivi's question as well. But I had a thought that I think it's a really important question I think our tendency, if we fall into adaptive grief, is to lose space for our own stories and other people's stories. And I think that the processes that God is inviting us into as a community of grief, to walk into these rhythms, the liturgy of grief, to walk into the rhythms and the liturgy of gratitude, creates more spaciousness. It creates a spacious place over time where we have a transformed experience of grief, where we can hold the disappointment of our own loss. And we also begin to have more space for the places where other people have that thing that we lost. And I think that's w what God is inviting us into this transformative place of grief where we have a softness toward our own loss and we have a softness toward somebody else's gain, really. And that's something I heard. This is a silly connection, but that's what I heard when Eric talked about not having cats. Like he decided that he hated cats because he couldn't have a cat. That's his adaptive grief. But his transformative grief says, wow, I'm so disappointed that I can't have a cat but I'm so glad that Vivi has cats, you know? So, and that's a totally different situation, but it's just a little tiny example of that spark of 
okay, yeah, maybe today you don't have the spaciousness for your grief and another person's joy in that one spot. But I think that over time, as you step into the liturgy of your grief and the liturgy of your gratitude, that you will find a healthy space for both. Yeah. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Psalms. Thank you that you have given us the capacity to experience loss and, and grief and to also hold on to the stories um, of joy and, and thankfulness and to hold those two things together in relationship with you. I pray that you would help us to walk into that more, to consider what that means in each of our lives. Um, bless us, Father, as we worship you, as we eat together, as we talk. Um, give us really good and rich conversation and draw us into relationship with you. In your name I pray. Amen.